Oh, hi. This week, I'm going to show you how I made this crop top bodice bustier, if you will, that's actually based on, flesh inspired by, this beer that I also got to help make. I mean, this was all me, but this was a, a group effort. And it was really cool because I've homebrewed before, but I've never done anything on like a big actual brewery system. And I've gone on a bunch of tours and like been told the process, but getting to participate was so cool. And to give some context, I do work for this brewery. I do like the farmer's market and brew fests and in-store tasting, stuff like that. I'm just excited to have gotten to do something like this with the other women that I work with because it's for a project called the Pink Boots Society which helps women in the beer industry. And I like our take on it because we're not like pinky people. We went with the name A Pale Tint of Red because I guess there's a flower that is called that. It also just feels kind of badass, which is how I feel about the can art as well as like, yes, it's flowery, but it's also like, I don't know, is calling it tough a silly word? <laughs> and it's these specific flowers because it's a hibiscus pale ale, it means the beer itself is kind of like a reddish pink. Anyways, I hinted at this in last week's video, which is where I show you how I developed my new sketching process. And I'm so goddamn excited about it. When I first had the idea, this is what my fashion design technique looked like. And it just, this ain't it. It's good for no it's good for getting the general concept down, but especially if I revisit something like this down the road, it's not quite as fleshed out where this, my friends, is a croquis I did of my own body. What an idea having one that actually looks like me instead of all of the ones that I was finding online that are pencil thin. This definitely helped me visualize what everything was going to look like. I've got some of the test swatches on here too, which I'll explain in a minute. But yeah, this was actually a pretty time consuming project where I don't always do highly detailed stuff because I convinced myself I don't have time to do it, where if I just prioritize taking the time to do it. I don't know. I feel like the past month I had a lot of mental growth with my sewing and just my sense of direction with things where I had a lot of windows of time where all I could do was just like lay there and think about things. And I also watched a ton of sewing videos. There's a bunch of really great videos by, ugh, I cannot remember the name of the channel, but I watched almost every single one of her videos while I was laid up on the couch. I will put the name right here. I can't believe I'm blanking because I spent so many hours with her content. We also watched some Angela Clayton and Sorena and some Closet Historian and Sostein. I'll put a little list to what got me through the worst of my really bad pain days. All of them do such detailed, beautiful work. And not that I don't think some of my pieces have been beautiful, but they're almost always more utilitarian. And I know that's kind of how my wardrobe has always been. And part of the issue I had when I first started sewing garments for myself is I would do these like big pieces that I wasn't actually going to wear. They weren't super my style and this didn't fit with anything else in my closet. I feel like I'm closing that gap because I made a lot of kind of neutral basics last year and I needed them. I'm glad I did that. I have a bunch of just plain solid color gathered skirts and I made myself a batch of like long sleeve t-shirts and lightweight sweaters. I do have some more knitwear that I'm going to make for myself. A little bit more fun but still fairly neutral. Like they're basically all different shades of gray, but like there's some skull fabric involved because as I've mentioned in the past, I really want to keep channeling teenage me and what she would have wanted to make and wear, which leads me to this top. I'm not generally a crop top person. If I had had more time, I probably would have made a whole dress. As you saw in the sketch, I had it mapped out with a black gathered skirt. Unfortunately, by the time I wore this, I had lost a bunch of weight from various aspects of recovery. So that was like drooping way lower than I was comfortable with where normally my gathered skirts I have fitted to like my high waist and it wasn't sitting there. I did end up having to change that last minute because there was another skirt that used to kind of fit too tight and then was also weirdly loose on me. One more note in that similar vein, something that bummed me out is that I measured myself for this top and then even just a week later by the time I wore it I had lost more weight that it wasn't fitting as nicely as it did a week before. But there's also other finishing things that I didn't do that would have made it look better too. Okay I've given enough of a preamble. Let us jump into the actual process of making this. So as I said started out with the sketch. Then it was a matter of figuring out how to make the print because I knew making the bodice would be pretty easy since I put a bunch of work into making this pattern fit me. I'll link up here if you want to see that process which then turned into my outer dress and I just knew I wanted something with princess seams so I could have that center 
panel be my version of the label design and then have black color blocking for the rest of it. So my first thought was, okay, I know people get custom fabric printed all the time. Maybe I can figure that out but then realize something like Spoonflower, or I've heard Joann's has a custom printing process as well, but I also know it takes forever to get Spoonflower to even do prints that already exist in getting them out, because I've done custom orders for people where it's just been like a month later that it's finally arrived, if not more. And I got to see the can design, which here's the whole label, by the way. I just, the second I saw it was like, I have to make something that looks like this. Plus having just figured out how to do sketches on my laptop, I also wanted to try just drawing more because it's not something I'm well versed in. Other options were trying this like printable transfer paper stuff where I've done really terrible transfer paper projects before. I actually made a baseball tee that I decided to print out a bunch of the Hamtaro hamsters and make like a little collage of them. But then because I had put it on a knit, as soon as I put it on, it like stretched everything out and there were just lines along all of the images and it was no good. And it almost started like flaking off after. So my experience with that was not great. If you know any good iron-on transfer paper options, it's something I haven't done since I was probably 12 years old. I don't know when Hemtaro was on, but had to have been pre-age 16, so like pre-2005. It's been a minute. I had also considered like hand drawing all of this, but again, I'm enjoying doing the digital art because you can like correct stuff and it's much less permanent. And then, and then it occurred to me if I take some fabric, I had initially thought to do white fabric, which Thankfully, I did the smart thing. This is the kind of shit I'm talking about where I never put that extra effort into like the highly detailed things or like do test runs. I never used to do mock-ups of the actual garments to like do the test fits, any of that stuff. And I never used to do test swatches like this where I even test out like ironing stuff sometimes just to make sure I have things on the right setting because I torched right through the front center skirt of my goon cosplay that I did beginning of last year, which I think if I add some patches and like make it look a little more roughed up, that's gonna suit the character. So not the end of the world, but like, what was I thinking? This could have so easily been avoided. But anyway, once I started using these fabric markers that were sent to me from my dear fairy god Cheryl, which having done projects with them in the past, they're not good for like precise drawing because they kind of bleed into the rest of the fabric because fabric is absorbent. But because I was doing this kind of gradient, it was actually going to be perfect for this and kind of give those soft edges. I didn't want like harsh lines between the pink and the red, but I wasn't quite getting the shade I wanted on the white fabric, even layering some orange on top of the red because it is like a very, very warm tone, probably close to the red orange crayon by Crayola. And even worse than that, like I could not get the right fuchsia shade. And also on the white, it just looked like someone had colored in white fabric with markers. Like it was not looking how I wanted wanted it to look. Then thankfully, because I hoard everything, I had some leftover bag lining material. I mean, I don't remember what this was initially, probably some kind of bed sheet. Plus these other pink fabrics that I had laying around that, you know, I looked at, but two of the three weren't the right color at all. So I ended up going with this kind of shinier pink one and realized, oh, if I use this as the base color, because this is the correct shade of like that bright fuchsia color. And then I put the red over that, which is what this little test swatch is. And then I also made sure that the heat transfer vinyl I was going to use would work on the pink fabric because not every fabric takes the heat transfer vinyl very well. I have learned the hard way at the finishing step of a project because I didn't do a test piece, but I'm learning. I'm getting better. Taking these lessons to heart. Trying not to just take the easy route, lazy route. Oh, right. I also had some black fabric left over from I think I bought the yardage I have for custom Hogwarts robes, which I still have a bunch cut out. I haven't sewn those in years, but I am supposed to be working at a convention this fall for myself doing like a sewing nerd table. I haven't done it in years because, and we'll see where things are at come September, but I'm supposed to be in the artist alley at Granite Con, Granite State Comic Con. I did have plenty of black fabric that I could have self-lined it. And I do wish I did cause it is a little stiffer, but I had just enough of the pink from this middle panel to do the lining, like just barely enough. So it seemed like fate to put it in there. Also, it occurred to me like, Deodorant stains show up less on pink, so having that on the inside would be good. I've ruined many a garment with my sweating prowess, so I try to plan ahead for these things. <laughs> Let's move on to the heat transfer vinyl process. So I had to draw something to then cut out of the vinyl. I spent a decent chunk of time just noodling around with the drawing program and not trying to rush through drawing out these flowers. I am so proud of how this came out. Like this doesn't seem like something I could have made. And I know that's still like a bit of a confidence self-esteem problem. Like, I think this is really cool. 
objectively where I'm trying to get better and better and I am getting there. Knowing it's my work so from a subjective standpoint with that context to it, like also still appreciating it and not just being like, well, but I made it so it's garbage. <laughs> Ooh, hurt myself with that one. And I actually ended up having a lot of fun doing all of this. I don't know the last time I had fun just drawing a thing. It's so rare, but between this project and doing all of the fashion design sketches I'm doing, which saying that feels wild to me because I don't know how to word this. I don't let my fashion sense come out much. It's been happening more and more, but it also hasn't had me in mind where I know part of it is letting the, letting the fabric tell you what it wants to become and working with that. Like if the fabric isn't necessarily a me thing, it's not like the garment shouldn't exist. And that's why I will put some of those things up in my Etsy shop. Ooh, okay. I'm not going to do like a hard launch just yet because there's nothing new up there but I did make a website it's a square up website I will link below if you want to check it out and if you have feedback please 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 let me know because I I know nothing about website design I don't know if it's like easy to use and interface with as a customer I tried to look at it from my side but I also don't do a lot of online shopping this is not a ploy to get you to like buy stuff feedback would be incredibly helpful if you have any thank you so much to Sarah and Carrie in particular because everybody, but especially those two, I get so easily overwhelmed when it comes to anything remotely businessy, which why I do what I do, I don't know. If I could just make things all day, every day, and then have someone else deal with like the administrative side of things, that would be delightful. Growing pains, getting there, I'm learning slowly but surely. But yeah, that is live. And there's only a couple of things that are in my Etsy shop because I didn't want all the inventory in both because a lot of the things are one-off. But as I do like batches of stuff like earrings, oh, I have a new earring design that I'm so excited about. I have a current hyperfixation. If you follow my TikTok, you'll find what is easily my most viewed video on there. And it's making me flustered even just thinking about it. So mm -hmm. things are great. The dopamine fix I'm getting from so much Moulin Rouge and Moulin Rouge the musical is so what I needed. I don't know if this happens to anybody else and I have been told this is a facet of ADHD. I know it's also a facet of like autism and some other neurodivergent things where as you have all witnessed over the years like remember Rocket Man? Remember when I went to see Rocket Man three different times in theaters and then just spent probably a month making various outfits related to that? I just could not get enough of it and it almost gave me like a high. And I used to get really annoyed because I felt like I'm deep in the fangirl rabbit hole. I am intolerable talking about this thing. But it's one of the nice things about having the brain that I have, wired as it is, is that I can literally feel that level of joy and excitement and like full body chills over and over again from the same piece of media and like different aspects of it. Not that it happens all the time and it is very intense. Like I know I can be a bit much when it's happening, but I'm currently in one of those rabbit holes right now with Moulin Rouge, which I have loved since middle school. That movie, the number of times I have done a dramatic reenactment of the elephant love medley scene with most of my friends. I have goosebumps just thinking about it. It's been a fixture of my life for many, many years to 20, 20 years? Oh, okay. It came out in, oh, 2001, over 20 years? Mm-hmm. So there's also Moulin Rouge the musical, which I'm very precious about that original soundtrack from the movie. And I have to say, like, it, the musical is so, so, so good. It's so good. And yes, I have watched a couple bootlegs. I understand seeing live theater as it is and all the surprises and everything is great. I certainly cannot afford to go see Moulin Rouge on Broadway in New York City. I have seen one Broadway show. It did feel a bit like a once in a lifetime kind of thing. Maybe I'll get to see another Broadway show down the road, but like that is super not feasible at the moment and that's okay. One of my biggest regrets is not going to see the preview in Boston because a friend got two tickets and offered one to me, but I couldn't afford it. So then she took her sister and I'm glad, I'm glad she got to go. And I was absolutely green with envy when I saw the photos of their seats and everything, but there are worse things in the world and there are bootlegs of shows. It's a complicated topic, but it is also so extremely inaccessible to the majority of people. I think being able to watch it in some capacity is cool. Though, of course, the footage isn't pristine because someone's usually hiding a camera in their pocket. So you gotta make do. But my goodness, I digress. I am in a Moulin Rouge rabbit hole. This is the one like self-produced drug that I will follow and let myself get deep in a K-hole with because it's just me being very, very excited about things. I think this is why I used to go to concerts as much as I did, where I went to over a hundred shows in one year and I, same thing, like I never drank at shows. I never did any other, I always want to say barbiturates. I don't know why that word delights me so. 
I don't even know if it's the right application for it, but never did any of that stuff. I'm fairly straight-laced, like, I was scared to take the pain meds that I took, and for good reason, because I got so sick coming off of them, and want to do them even less. Like, I have to get talked into taking a fucking ibuprofen when I have a headache. But instead of getting annoyed with myself for getting into these, like, deep fangirl k-holes and thinking I'm stupid or something for enjoying things so intensely, it's just, let myself ride that high. It doesn't come around very often, like, maybe a couple times a year I get this kind of fixation on things, and it doesn't last forever. It's probably like a couple weeks, and not that I completely move on from it. I do, I almost like collect these things that I get so overly excited about, and they still bring me joy, but not, not to that extreme after a while, because the novelty has worn off, and that is, again, ADHD brain stuff, and it's just neat to learn like why that happens, and why other people don't seek stuff out the way that I do, and realizing it's Oh, because they genuinely don't experience it the same way. It makes me so intensely emotional. Even just seeing shitty quality pocket recordings <laughs> of these shows, I can only imagine what it'd be like in person. So anyway, this has been its own rabbit hole. Let us dig ourselves back out and get back on track with the project. So we have drawn our flowers and now it is time to start messing around with it in the Cricut program. As you can see, I have like a cluster of flowers and then I have three separate ones that are also part of the same file because I don't want to have to manipulate every single individual flower. And then having a handful of individual flowers to do space fillers seemed like the best option for me. So I just duplicated as many as I could and then put them into the like matte layout thing. And then I realized, right, I only have so much black heat transfer vinyl, but because the pattern piece is just the center front princess seam bodice section, I think there was just enough to get this done. And I left a chunk of the heat transfer vinyl uncut just so I could use some like space fillers at the end. To figure out where everything was gonna get laid out, I traced this piece on some paper and then I measured out the seam allowance because I knew I had to be like really frugal. And obviously there doesn't have to be flowers in the seam allowance. So I trimmed that down to save as much space as possible and laid that bit over the piece of heat transfer vinyl I had to see where I was gonna have to place everything. Now, there are some top corners that I knew was just gonna have to get filled with extra plain black. And there was one corner at the bottom that I needed to fill in as well. Then I just started matching up all of the flowers, mushing them together in the design space, rotating things and making it look kind of even and like decently spaced out, trying to make it look nice and just working within the parameters of where the vinyl piece I had ended. So, you know, it hit the eight or nine inch mark. So on the screen, I was making sure none of the flowers were gonna be past that on the map. It took forever, like, I think pushing 45 minutes is maybe the longest cutting process that I've ever had done. So I think just getting the flowers sorted out was a whole day. And then it was another two days later that I had finally weeded everything out just while I was watching something on TV. I wasn't in the Moulin Rouge hole yet when that was happening. I was probably still watching Sostein videos, though she did make a Moulin Rouge inspired dress. It may have been percolating in my brain afterwards, <laughs> which, oh my God, that dress is so pretty. We're not doing this again. I'm cutting myself off. Stay on track, God damn it. <laughs> then yeah, this is actually where I did all of my test swatching and deciding like what fabric was gonna go where and you know, realizing the white wasn't gonna work. And also that would've been way more work. Like I would've had to color the white pink and then put red over it. Where if I just start with pink in the first place and then put the darker color in stripes on top, like, always overcomplicating things for myself. But I got there, I got there. I gave myself the time to think about it. So, you know, things are still okay. <laughs> and let me tell you, even just looking at the flowers cut out on the full sheet like this, I got so pumped about how this was gonna look, even though we weren't like done yet, but I just, I knew I was on the right track when I saw it. Couldn't believe that I made that with my hands and my brain. So then I ironed it on and we'll figured out that, the yes, the bottom corner under. would be able to get covered with a little chunk of spare heat transfer vinyl, but these top sections were a little too big and I actually thought it would end up looking better if I just used some scrap black pieces. So I cut straight lines across, made sure there was extra seam allowance on both ends. I actually ended up using the lining piece as like a template to make sure I was cutting things out correctly because I didn't have any extra of any of this to fuck it up. So I wanted to be really, really diligent. Super pleased with how that came out. Then it was time to cut out everything else. Oh, also throwing it back to my wonderful fairy god, Cheryl. She gifted me this like pattern notcher. I don't know why this made such a big difference. I have such a hard time not cutting notches too deep slash not deep enough. When I'm cutting out fabric, like 
I just feel like I fuck it up every time and I've always wanted one of these little chomper guys and she gifted me one and it was extremely helpful and like just really fun to use. Ooh, and then I also forced myself to research a technical element to all of this, which was swapping out the closure for the back here because I didn't want to put a zipper because I didn't have any separating zippers that were short enough for this. Usually this bodice is part of a full dress, so having a normal non-separating zipper is fine. Something you're like stepping into where I wouldn't be able to get this over my head if it was attached at the bottom or top in the back without coming apart. So zipper wasn't really an option. And I wasn't gonna do like full proper button placket. I also had no buttons that were even close to matching this. So I decided as shown in my sketch, that's when I settled on doing little cam snaps in the back. Cause you can definitely tell that's what that is from the drawing. <laughs> when I was really trying to refresh myself on making button plackets earlier this year with some of the skirts I did, especially the denim one, I felt like I wasn't getting the math right. So I measured out the cam snap heads, which are half an inch wide, and I wanted a full width of one inch. Previous me thought you had to add a full inch to each side. After doing the skirts that I did earlier this year, I realized that wasn't quite the right math because things were too big, but not by a ton. And I couldn't quite wrap my head around it and just didn't want to put the effort in at the time. So I just spent a decent amount of time looking around online. And if I can find the specific blog post, I will link it in the description. One of the images like made it click in my head. Yes, there needs to be an inch overlap, but the snap itself or like the button and the buttonhole, those are in the center of the placket, meaning at the half inch point. So you only need to be adding half an inch. And because I knew I was gonna sew the lining and the outer fabric right sides together and then flip it out and just use the normal amount of seam allowance that I already have accounted for in the pattern, I just added another half inch to that. And that seemed to do the trick. I don't know if I explained that very well. Again, if I find the blog post, I will link below. Oh, someone has decided to pay us a visit. Hello, baby boy. You want a custom hibiscus top too? Okay, let's rewind a little bit back from the snap installation and talk about cutting everything out and assembling. Cause I think adding the snaps was the very last step I did. Cause there was another finishing step I'll tell you all about at the end that I didn't do. That I didn't realize till after I had worn it out. Other than that front and center panel, all of the other outer pieces were cut out of the black fabric as well as the straps. And then I had just enough pink to do the lining. So that was great. There were a couple like damaged spots on this. So I just made sure all of those were lining pieces and not that center outer front piece. Once everything was cut and marked, I definitely fucked up the straps, but I didn't realize till I had already stitched them into place. But that was the easiest thing to correct. So as you look at this footage, just know I did realize my error by the end of this and was one of the only things I had to unpick, thankfully. So starting with the center front piece. Oh gosh, I forgot. I colored in with the red fabric marker after I ironed on the heat transfer vinyl. I completely forgot that step. That was like one of the two things I was adding to the front and center panel. It did take a while because I wanted to get good coverage and like make sure it kind of faded out into the regular pink. So again, not like harsh lines anywhere because it's such a soft transition between the colors on the can art. And if I got any of the red marker on top of the actual vinyl, I just like, licked my thumb and rubbed it off. Like, you know when you got dirt on your face as a kid and your mom would clean it off that way? That old chestnut, just cause you could see the marks otherwise. And then I gave it plenty of time to dry. I think I let it dry overnight and then started sewing it the next day. I would say we could go buy my clothes to tell if it's a different day, but I have regularly been wearing the same clothes for two to three days in a row cause I haven't left the house. Tomorrow's gonna be my first day back to work at one of my outside of the house jobs. I cannot tell you how excited I am to go to work. <laughs> I miss it, which is a good indicator, I suppose. Regardless of my attire, once that was dry, I started sewing all the pieces together. So I did the front side pieces, which is always the trickiest part for me on a princess seam bodice is doing the actual princess seams. So notching this when you're cutting out from the pattern, the most important, where side seams, I don't necessarily do that. Then I pressed those seams open and I also notched them. Here's the bodice with one side done and one not done. So you can just see the difference from the front and the back. I love how one side looks and I hate the other. If you're anything like me, say five, six years ago and refuse to iron things because it doesn't make that much of a difference, it absolutely does. So listen, you will start ironing things when you are ready to start ironing things. You have to want it. And I certainly didn't listen, even though I was repeatedly told that I should be pressing things. Just meant the things I was making looked worse. I was really the only one losing out, you know? Then once the front was constructed and all pressed out and I used my tailor's hand to do this, it can be a little tricky going over the curves if you don't have something like this. You could like ball up a towel or something, even a wad of cotton fabric or something that can take a lot of heat. And for the outer back pieces, I pressed the darts towards the back, towards the center, I suppose, because it is the back. So that, that could mean anything. I used to get confused by that kind of stuff on patterns. Usually if it's a side seam or shoulder seam, it's towards the back. And then if it's a front or back 
thing, like a dart that has to get pressed to one side or the other instead of open, it's suited towards the center. Though the thing that I have learned that helps reduce bulk is when you go to do the lining, like I'm about to show you, which same assembly steps, just started with the center, stitch the princess seams, press those open. Then before I attached at the sides, I did add in the darts. I even did the thing you're supposed to do with darts does not back tack at the end, but you kind of sew from the bottom and you kind of like sew over it and then you leave two tails of the top and bottom thread just a little bit so that you can then tie knots because if you back tack it's just not gonna press out very nicely and because the outer shell had the darts pressed towards the center back like towards my spine I pressed the darts for the lining the opposite direction six layers if they were both pressed the same direction versus them being opposite now it's only three layers that I have to go across which can make a difference it's gonna lay a lot smoother this way okay then once all the panels were assembled I laid them on top of each other just to make sure I had everything where it was supposed to go things lined up and this is where I realized if I'm sewing this whole thing right sides together and flipping it out I need to make a gap in the lining somewhere so I picked the side seam because that seemed like the easiest spot to restitch after because it's nice and straight it didn't have to get notched so there's like the full seam allowance to work with there's also laying the lining on top like this that I remembered I wanted to trim down some of the lining because when it gets sewn right sides together and I wanted to flip it inside out under stitching would have helped, but I forgot to do that, so it didn't happen. Having something lined like this where it's getting bagged out, as they say, when you flip it right sides out like this, if the lining's a little bit smaller, it helps if you wanna roll the edge of the outer fabric to the back just the tiny tiniest bit. It doesn't lead to a ton of bagginess on the inside now with the lining because I kind of shrunk it down just a little bit. This is definitely something I could have saved time doing and would have been more precise when I cut everything out. Well, listen, I had already used a lot of brain power on this project, so I did what I could at the time. And do not forget to notch your curves. Also, while I was sewing it right sides together, that's when I inserted the straps and Again, I, I made them too long. Ooh, and as far as making the straps, you know, I folded it in half, sewed it right sides together the long way. And then I actually tried a new tube turning technique, everyone's favorite step in a project, because I had watched some Angela Clayton videos and she showed her favorite way to turn a tube, which is getting a nice big knot at one end of some like durable thread, either like double slash quadrupled up or just like, you know, button thread, whatever. I have some chunky stuff like this that I use sometimes. That's for, it says repairing couches or I guess general upholstery. It's not couch specific, but this is an example of something I would use that kind of thread for. So I got a nice big knot at the end and had like, you know, a decent length of thread so I could scoot this through the tube. And I also used a dull needle. So like one I use for cross stitching, nothing sharp that's gonna wanna poke through the fabric. Obviously with enough force, this would go through the fabric, but not the goal here. So having a blunter edge will help this go through smoothly. And then once you have the needle at the other end of the tube, like you put a knot at one end, she says about a quarter inch down, and then you get the needle with the thread out at the other end of the tube. And you start pulling and like trying to get the knot to tuck that first edge inside itself to start flipping it right side out. I had a tough time with this. Granted, my first attempt, maybe with practice, it'll get easier. I eventually got it turned out with this technique, but then I used my trusty old bodkin. I stopped filming in here because it started to feel very, very gross. My pain levels weren't at their peak when I was working in here because I was like completely non-functional for the first two weeks of my recovery from everything. But this was a point where I could work for like little windows of time and then I could go sit on the couch and in little chunks between trying to eat and trying to nap. That's when I did all of the like tedious ironing, pressing something like this out can be super satisfying, but it's also kind of time consuming and finicky and a bit of a pain in the ass. And I wanted to make sure the corners were poked out perfectly and that I was rolling the edge like over to the lining side a bit. So there was like the littlest bit of black showing on the inside of the bodice. Again, that would have been easier with understitching. That is the one thing that I really would go back in time and redo where everything else is like, is fine. And yeah, once everything was pressed, I did what I thought was the last step and installed all these little cam snaps, decided I wanted five. I had a flannel on over this top when I actually wore it out the day this beer was released. The back was completely covered, so it didn't end up mattering in the end, though it makes me really happy to see. And again, little extra details. This is the stuff I would like to give myself more time to do. Oh, right. The one thing I did forget until after I wore it and I got home and then saw as I never actually closed up the gap in the lining. It was fine. I didn't notice while I had it on. Certainly nobody else noticed while I was wearing it out. Anyways, we'll see how I'm feeling as far as crop tops once I like get some of my weight back. Cause I like, I get, I got some body issues happening right now. I'm like almost the weight I was in high school, which freaks me out. Cause I am a 33 year old woman and I don't like that. <laughs> Anyways, at least for the day that I wore this out, colored my hair and did some makeup. It was the first time I like, 
done myself up I think probably this whole year. It felt really nice just to even for an hour and a half, two hours, like go out and feel as normal as I could. And I enjoyed dressing up and the skirt I chose to wear, the amount of gap between the top and the skirt. Like if I was sitting, I slouched like a motherfucker. There was no gap there and I had a flannel over most of it. It was a fun experiment. I wasn't as uncomfortable with it as I thought I might be. Now that I've made this, I kind of want to try making, it always just makes me think of the Hamilton. I don't know the term for it. Are they the stays? They like kind of dip down in the front. It's almost like a, like a soft V shape. I feel like there's some historical costumes I made at the costume shop that had this like dip in the front. It was just a really interesting line as far as the, the bottom of it. Could be fun. I don't know. Let me know if you're interested. Ooh, maybe a scalloped edge. That feels annoying to do, but could look really cool and a fun detail to test out because I, yeah, I don't think I've ever done one. It's more work and that's why I've avoided it. So <laughs> overall, there are so few things that I am unhappy about with this. Again, just like li little finessing things from the outside, like people that I made this beer with and saw it when I wore it out, they weren't gonna notice any of those little bits that could have been tidier, you know? Things can just look nice without being perfect. So yeah, that was quite a journey, I think. I'm also just so excited about this project that I can't shut up about it. So I hope this has been somewhat entertaining or neat. Maybe you got inspired to make a thing, just had someone keep you company while you worked on your own project. As always, I got to do this and take the time to do this and take the time off for my surgery and recovery, which was two and a half weeks longer than I thought it was gonna be in the first place. So Jesus Christ, <laughs> thank you everyone over on my Patreon. Y'all are absolute rock stars. I appreciate you so fucking hard. And to everybody who's given me advice and supported my Etsy shop or just shared or commented or hell, even just watched a minute of one of my videos. It all means a lot that you give me any of your time and I really like our little community of bog trolls we have built. Us nerdy little craft gremlins. That's gonna do it for me. Bert has tucked himself back in his pen. This is not sponsored. I just think it's really cool I got to help make this beer. So if you get to try it somewhere, let me know how it is and if you like it because here's a secret. I don't even like hibiscus and I really enjoy this beer and I don't know how the head brewer does it because he's done that with multiple other flavors of things and it's absolute witchcraft but I got to participate in the sorcery this time and I think that's pretty damn cool. Okay I will see you back here with another video next Friday. Thank you so much for hanging out.